cans it up the penguins were changing. It's able to come out relatively easy. Let's keep Primo with the first. Primo cuts the attack, scores! There it is! Keith Primo! The much maligned center of the Philadelphia Flyers wins this game in the fifth overtime. Everybody, it's Isaiah. Just reminding you that FlyersNittyGritty.com and the OMB podcast are brought to you by Summit Public Adjusters. Hey, do you have damage to your home? Not sure who to call? We suggest that you call Summit Public Adjusters before your insurance company. Dealing with your insurance company can be very stressful. Let Summit take the stress out of the claims process. From storm damage to your roof, to toilet overflows, to broken pipes and fires, Summit gets you the most money for your repairs. So next time Mother Nature leaves you in need of repairs, call Summit Public Adjusters at 215-752-0560 or visit SummitPublicAdjusters.com, licensed in PA and New Jersey. Hey everybody, it is Isaiah Welcome back to the OMB Podcast. This is episode number 130. Flyers Training Camp is on, and we are here to talk about some of the things we've seen. And let's say hello to uh, Chef B. How how are you, man? Aching for some hockey. I can't wait for it to start. Tomorrow night's preseason game will be like like my my fix to hold me over. Yeah, that's right. Just put that... uh... That rubber around your arm real tight. And, and of course, with <laughs> us is the great Dan Silver. Hey, boys, what's going on? Good Monday night. Yeah, Monday night, a lot happening. It's a, it's a big game tonight for uh, the NFL fans. So, listen, the Flyers uh, are in training camp right now. They have some injuries. We, got, we talked about it last time. Uh, Kevin Hayes, he's out six to eight weeks. Uh, Samuel Moran, same period of time. Um, and uh, with the clean, knee cleanup procedure, Wade Allison has a apparently has a uh, high right ankle sprain, and it's indeterminate how long he'll be out. We talked about Zade Wisdom; he'll be probably going back to the CHL anyway. And then among the big names, uh, Tanner Lashinsky went back out, and he he's on the to be determined list along with Linus uh, Hogberg as well with an oblique muscle injury, uh, I'd say the Lashinsky is really the only one uh, besides the earlier injuries that uh, had a chance to really dent the roster, but we'll, we'll see how that works out. But, um, yeah, so, uh, gents, um, the Flyers are putting together their lines, and, Dan, I- I'm going to start with you tonight. Uh, it looks like A.B. wants to have continuity from the word go. And if we're looking at lines, we're talking about Sean Couturier centering what could be considered a first line with Claude Giroux and Travis Konechny. And then you have what may be a second line, Morgan Frost centering JBR and Joel Faraby. I'd like to make an alteration there, but we'll, we'll talk about that. And then we have Derek Broussard in between Oscar Lindblom and Cam Atkinson, and then we have uh, probably a fourth line with, um, I guess it would be um, uh, Scott Lawton with uh, Nate Thompson, and uh, who am I missing there? I guess uh, Nick Obey-Kubel. So, Dan, just uh, some thoughts about that. Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously with Kevin Hayes being out now for probably a month or two, you're looking at Morgan Frost as the guy who, going into camp, the question was, is he going to make the Flyers? I don't think that's a question any longer because he sort of has to be with the Flyers. But the good things are that he, you know, he he, he put on some weight. He looks really good. 
he's definitely got an NHL skill set. So it's just going to be about kind of translating uh, the physicality a little bit so that he, you know, there was a play in training camp the other day where Elliot Desnoyer, uh, who's a, a prospect for the Flyers, a good prospect, but a prospect nevertheless, uh, beat Frost to the front of the net, put in a rebound. Frost got really upset, smashed a stick against the boards. You know, he kind of, he realizes like, okay, I'm going to be in the NHL. Like these are the battles that I need to win. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's something that we're, we're going to be looking for from Frost. Obviously the, the, the team's depth at center was one of the issues heading into camp. So the Hayes injury hurts a lot. They're going to need Broussard to be pretty good, but that line with him, Lindblom and Atkinson, that kind of highlights one of the other uh, real highlights of camp so far, which is that it looks like by all, you know, by all means that Oscar Lindblom is kind of back to a hundred percent. And obviously he went through the, the situation with the cancer and it looks like, you know, last year he was not very effective this summer. He had a full summer to train. He said that he took two weeks off at the beginning of the summer and then trained for the rest of the summer. And it looks like it, he looks fantastic. So Lindblom's a guy who that's a big deal. If he can be back to a hundred percent, Another guy that's that I think is going to be vastly improved is Nicholas Abe Cubell. Last year, uh, you know, he's he's not the biggest hockey IQ player, but he's the kind of guy who, on a fourth line, is can be tenacious on the forecheck, can score some goals. They ran into some problems last year with him taking penalties. Look, I think it's all part of the growing pains, and he's a guy who, if he can get back to just the tenacious forecheck, chipping in with some goals not taking dumb penalties. He's still a relatively young player. I think that Abe Kubel could really be a fixture on that fourth line for, for years to come, actually. So that kind of gets me excited. And then, you know, we're hoping for a bounce-back year from Travis Konechny and, and hope that Joel Farabee can kind of build on his breakout year. So, so despite the fact that Hayes is out, I still think that the forward core it looks fairly strong. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, Chef, I'm going to go to you in a minute. I just wanted to make some comments about uh, Oscar. You know, I was reading a friend of the show, Anthony DeMarco, from the fourth period, and he is getting word that they're very impressed and they like what they see from, um, you know, Morgan right now. And, you know, it has to be. It's really important. But uh, Bill uh, Meltzer chimed in. He'd really like to see... Lindblom on that line instead of JVR because you know you already have some defensive pressure with with Morgan and you were just talking about his battle with Denoye and I, I think if Oscar shows enough that might be a little bit of better support for Morgan and we know if Oscar's back he's certainly worthy of a, a middle six spot easily so you know, we'll, we'll, we'll watch that situation. Yeah, I'd have no problems with if they if if they say that you know JVR is not a great fit defensively with Frost. I'd have no problems with with moving Limblom. I'm sure that I'm sure that there will be some adjustments to the lines after the few preseason games. Oh yeah, yeah, we all know. I mean, we've all been watching this game enough. You know, they get all white knuckled about the lines and combos, and then boom, you get one bad game in a regular season. And it's all you know, it's like fifty two pickup, Chef. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to kind of piggyback that whole thing, at least with Oscar, with him being back. And, and I think it was spoken to, I think A.B. spoke to it on Jason Martinez, uh Daily, Flyers Daily. And it was about how good Oscar was along the boards before his uh, diagnosis and how, how kind of like almost forget that and how mm -hmm. he's back, he's in shape and and then the players that came in, like somebody like Cam Atkinson, and it, you were talking about uh, Nicholas Abe and Kubel. If they all can get to where they were before, it's going to be hell to play against them on, against the boards. I mean, I really do think that this team is stronger along the boards now. I mean, it does hurt that Kevin Hayes is out. But like Dan said, you know, there's somebody, you know, a team still looks like it is a good team still on paper. And – it's going to be all about meshing the lines. And I, I really do believe that Oscar should probably be on that, that second line only because, and I said it before, and I'm not trying to harp on them, like Morgan Frost defensive liabilities at center. I, and that's why when I think last show we talked about possibly him eventually or maybe moving the wing, a, even if it's a trial. I, I just think that if you're going to have Morgan Frost on a line, I would probably try to secure him 
uh, with somebody that's a little more defensive oriented and maybe can uh, help ease some of that burden for him. Yep, could be. Uh, speaking of someone who's really in shape, and the number one guy who's been like the top conditioned athlete on this team for years has been dethroned. It was Provy. It is now the man I call Mongo, Rasmus Ristolainen. And, and, and Dan, uh, he's out there throwing his weight around, kind of getting settled in terms of systems and things like that. But we just haven't seen a player like this with this kind of mobility and physicality combo. And you can definitely see why the Flyers went all in to get him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, his his physical ability, his size, his skill has never been a question, right? It's really all about the decision making, the hockey IQ for him. So I'm not surprised that he's come into camp and he's basically, you know, in the same shape as, as Ivan Provorov. Like those are just two physical beasts on the blue line. And moving away from Buffalo could be a really big deal for him. I mean, that franchise is a complete dumpster fire. Ristolainen's been playing top pair minutes there. He's never really had seasoned um, partners to play with. And you just it's really hard to, to get a read on a guy when he's playing on a team that's that bad. Now he's going to get to play on the second pair with Travis Sanheim, who's also very, very physically gifted. Already in camp, we've seen the physicality. I saw Ristolainen like, drill JVR into the boards. He, he's the kind of guy who, who players don't like playing against. And I think it's going to be exciting to see what he brings. It's it's the, the divide on Twitter is is pronounced with him because you've got the folks that from an analytics perspective just dump on him all the time. And then you've kind of got the counter reaction of the folks who, because of that, are sort of like all in on him. Oh, he's going to win the Norris Trophy. You know, they just kind of want to kind of want to shove it up the analytics guys throats um, or shove it down their throats, as the case may be. So it's going to be interesting. I think the truth is going to be somewhere in between. Like, I think he's going to be a better player than he was in Buffalo um, from a results standpoint. And I'm excited to, to see what he can bring. I mean, he in Buffalo, he was on the power play. He's not going to be on the power play in, here in Philly, which I think is going to kind of let him concentrate more on playing his game. So I think there's a lot of positive indicators for Ristolainen headed into this season. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that. And, and Chef, let, let's go through the pairings it was pretty de predictable from day one uh Provy with ryan ellis we'll talk a little bit about the, the subplot there it's a positive definitely and of course we just mentioned risto with uh, travis sandheim and keith yandel the veteran who's playing like he wants to gain his spot on murrett more than just saying hey i have a i want to pass doug jarvis for the iron man streak and he's with Justin Braun, who was the settling influence with last year's team. And then look for the seventh guy until Moran comes back, uh, Adam Clendenning, who's bounced around the league and recently played with the Penguins. Uh, what, what's your assessment of uh, those pairings and kind of what you've heard so far and read about? Well, uh, with the top pairing, I think that uh, we didn't even talk about all yet, so I'll save that. Uh, this the second pairing, Risto and, and Travis Sanheim, I, I think they're going to be a pleasant surprise. I think both of them have different, they're like compliments to each other's game. I think without that top pairing moniker on them, I really think that Rissalana could just, like Dan said, concentrate on, on playing his game and not have to worry about all the other factors. The pressure's not on him. The pressure's on Ellis. And we'll talk about that. I, I see that in our notes about following Proby like a puppy. So, uh, but, and then you have uh, Yandel. I, I think it's awesome. I mean, he's out there working hard every shift in practice. By all accounts, he's not taking anything for granted. And it, to be honest with you, I think that's great. I think it's, uh, that's the way you want your veterans to, you know, to lead by example. I mean, he's showing these kids here. There's a lot of kids mixed in with all this. Like players like Morgan Frost, like you have to work every shift so that, you know, Elliot Desdonay doesn't like, you know, beat you on a puck. And, and you know, and and that's good. I think that's a good influence. And the seventh man, hopefully the seventh man, 
doesn't even come into a factor for a while until we get some uh, stability in the day. But I, I think uh, I always liked Braun. I liked him when he was a shark. And you're right. I, I think he was uh, the, basically the, the stabilizer last year. He was like the unsung hero uh, of the defensive core because he, he was trying to calm everybody down. But he, even him at one point, I think it was – was it him that said that? Like, I've never seen guys crumble so fast or yep, yep. Be so soft. Yeah. So, that I mean, that's good. I mean, that, that, I like that that a veteran of his stature can still be able to call out, say, hey, we, we you know, part of my friends, we shit the bed, and, and it wasn't good enough. So, yeah, that, I mean, that's my assessment. I'm assuming we're going to go into detail about, you know, Provi and uh, Alice, so I'll save that, all right? Yeah, well, why don't we? I, I mean, uh, Ivan Provorov has a stalker. His name is Ryan Ellis. <laughs> and <laughs> we'll all get into this a little bit. I think Ryan Ellis is a solid pro. It's just t- kind of taking everything in with the organization. And mm-hmm. he's like a, a neon sign flashing. I'm here to help. I want to be everything you want me to be and traded for. And he's like 100% checking all the boxes right attitude, just without being, a, you know, in kind of like an egomaniac, but just kind of like the hockey way of saying, I'm all in. And, hey, what else could you ask for? I mean, he's he's trying to learn from some of the things he appreciates in what Ivan does. And obviously, Ivan is going to have a lot to learn with the steadiness and the just, the, the I guess, the smoothness and uh, seamless a way in that Ryan Ellis approaches the game and how it all comes out and flows on the ice. So, uh, Chef, you go first, and then Dan will go to you. Well, I, I, I love that. I love the whole story of it. it, it it's on and off the ice. He follows him around, and and it's just it, it said, I, I want to get to know the guy because I think that's important. Like, this is, you know, this is what the difference between uh, being in the league for a while and then being an uppercomer. That's the difference. I mean, and the guy takes it serious. I think all of the new acquisitions that came into this team, I uh, I think that, you know, what we sent out, you know, uh, you know being Patrick and, and Shane and Ghost and all, I, I just think that the, the, they shipped out negativity and brought in some rah-rah guys. And like I've said so many times, you can never underestimate the power of rah-rah guys in your locker room. And they're showing this. These guys are all positive guys. Yandel's, I think I heard Yandel's living with 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 Kevin Hayes just because to help him get him through everything. Yeah, he moved in with him. Yeah, it's awesome. This is what you want. This this is the makings of. I don't want to say. I don't want to say it early. Maybe I should. To, I don't want to care. It doesn't matter. But the first one to say this is the makings of a, a really storied season with everything that's happened around this team, and I just think uh, all these guys coming in have one thing in common, and that's. They're all positive energy guys. And it's really, I think you've seen it in Drew in practices. He's been, I mean, I have is it me or is it Drew even got a step faster than he was last year? It's amazing. It, 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 just the practice, it, they all look great. And I think it's rubbing off on the players that are still here, the new ones coming in with that attitude. And I think you can't, you, you can't deny that. Well, you know, it's like the old uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross line. I'll clean it up from Alex Baldwin. It's F or walk. Dan? Yeah, I, that was my favorite part of the, this week, this past weekend, was the press conference with Ryan Ellis. Because as Chef said, you just tell how much of a professional it is. So basically, you know, they asked him, you know, what, what you know, you're playing with Ivan Provorov. What are you doing to kind of... Um, you know, what do you, what are your, what are your takes on it? And he basically said, you know what? I'm following Ivan Pro around everywhere. I'm going to the gym with him. We're riding the bike together. We're hanging out off the ice. And he said, you know, it's because I think that that's going to help our, um, you know, that's going to help our chemistry on the ice together. And, and then he, you know, and then he started talking about how the Flyers organization is different from Nashville, where anything he asks for, he's gotten. And he can just that he said that's not kind of the case in a small market. You can just tell that this guy does everything right off the ice and he does everything right on the ice. And this is basically what the Flyers were missing last year without Niskanen, because that's what Matt Niskanen brought. He was like the consummate professional. And you can tell that's what Ryan Ellis is. And so. 
it it just brings a smile to her face. Him talking about how he's going to be following around Ivan Provorov everywhere, getting to know him better. He one thing he said, which almost brought a tear to my eye, was like he's like he said, you know, before I met Ivan Provorov, I didn't think that anyone, uh, you know, was kind of as emotionally like into hockey as I was. And he's like, but he gives me a run for my money. And so we're talking about two guys that both love the sport of hockey more than anything and and are going to Ellis is going to do everything in his power to make sure that you know that pairing is is phenomenal and you watched them in training camp so far and on the ice we talked about in the offseason like I think before the Flyers got Ellis who the who the best fits would be and I think we sort of agreed that Ryan Ellis might be like the perfect fit Mm -hmm. we just didn't think he was attainable but now we're seeing why we thought that because of how professional he is, then on the ice, his hockey IQ is so high. He just always makes the right play. He's just a natural hockey player. He's great passes, great reads on the ice, great stick defensively. It's kind of what you want Cam Ellis, or sorry, Cam York to kind of develop into, which I think he's going to have a, a, a great chance to kind of mentor him. So the Ryan Ellis stuff, I just absolutely loved. I think that he's going to really bring the best out of a lot of players on this team. And I, let's hope he can stay healthy because that's been his one problem has been kind of staying healthy. Mm-hmm. But I just think that that top pair with him and Provorov is going to be great on the ice. And I think that his professionality is going to permeate this team off the ice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. And, and there's so many positive storylines and listen, well, we're kind of jaded also as well. I mean, we've seen a lot of hockey and we realize none of this is going to mean a hell of beans if we're here and it's Christmas and this team is just struggling. OK, we get it. But now is the time. If you're going to have positivity and you want to reflect on the contrast between what this team has showed us in 19 and in last year and you want to kind of get more back to 2020, there's reason to feel that way. There's a lot of great storylines and along with what we're hearing from Ellis and Oscar, and you notice, yeah, Chef, it is, you notice that off the ice, the storylines weren't that great. Yet it had Jake last year calling out Sealski. You know, but this year, I think AV's kind of grown a little bit. You notice, like, usually when players are injured, they kind of like, they do their thing with their rehab and skating and they kind of stay out of the way of, of the guys that have to play. But during this camp, at least, you know, with everything that's going on with Kevin Hayes, even though he's hurt, I mean, with everything, the tragedy and everything with his brother, AV makes the right move, in my opinion, by giving him support, let him hang around the ice and get that positive vibe to, and I think it's a, a kind of a, uh, a synergistic thing, you know, and a, a, a good thing, a positive move. And like you were talking about the way he's living with the Andal and you're going to have guys like Cam Atkinson, a guy who played with his brother. Uh, you can expand on that. Yeah. Uh, I'm just glad that there's another outlet for him to like seek, you know, uh, I guess help or whatever, uh, you know, help healing or d- 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 just simply deal with healing. You know, like I, I said it before, I have five brothers. I couldn't imagine losing one, you know, uh, one of them that they all, they're, they're incredible. It's, it's, it's our identity almost where, you know, we're, we're the boys, you know? So, uh, so I can only imagine, but I, I love the fact that it, it to me, it just seems like more like it's a team. It's just, I mean, I laughed. I said it the other day, I said, to somebody i'm like it, it's like this is like the major league movie with hockey players you know <laughs> you can't bring in all these crafty veterans and all these characters and all these different things and it, it's relatable you know to to see these guys come through their adversity and uh, and other places and 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 here and and just be together as a team it's funny that you use the whole christmas reference i was about to say before you know uh you, you said it was this is like the best thing about this season so far is it it's it's the weeks leading up for christmas you know it's uh, anything is possible you could get any present you want you don't know i mean you're, until you open them it's like you know it's, it's anything's still possible so it really is like a good time to be a flyers fan because anything's possible right now 
you know, Allison could come back earlier. Kevin, Kevin Hayes' injury could be better. And now we got a full lineup and we're, we're crushing and we got guys that are fighting to get in this team, you know? So uh, everything's possible. And I, I just think that I'm just glad they're showing signs of a more cohesive unit. You're here when you didn't hear anything last year about this team, about any off ice stuff. That's concerning. Like, hanging out or doing something or whatever, all the good teams over the years, it, it seems like whether it's baseball, football, hot, there's always a core group. When the Eagles won the Super Bowl, there was like 14 guys that would go, like, I don't know, the church together or something like that. And you had the, the Phillies, they would uh, all uh, train together, that kind of thing. So I, I just think the camaraderie, sh- camaraderie doesn't end on the ice. I guess it's all involving. And the better I think they are at that is the better team that they could possibly be. Yeah, and there's no doubt. And of course, we're not going to go back to the legendary days in South Jersey with the Flyers <laughs> yeah, and the Bullies. Yeah, we get that. But uh, it, a team that plays well, wins together, sticks up for each other. We're going to see more of that this year. These were all issues, and the players understand that. It came through loud and clear. I'm sure it came up in the exit interviews, and Chuck acted upon it. So here we are, and hopefully this is the launching into a uh, a season where there's uh, a lot more to be positive about. Now, uh, gents, I'm going to go, Dan, to you. Now, we realize, again, these power play units that AV put together are subject to change, especially with Allison and Hayes out of the lineup. But top power play with Claude Giroux on the left side, uh, Couturier on the right, uh, Konechny in the slot, JVR, net front, and Keith Yandel, who I think appropriately should be running a power play. That's the kind of power play they like in terms of puck movement, and that seems to be the preferred uh, scheme for um, Michelle Therrien. The second power play unit looks like it's more of a shooting power play to some degree. You have Cam Atkinson on the right, Broussard in the slot, uh, Faraby net front, Provrov on the left side, Ryan Ellis on at the point, and then you have uh, Morgan Frost who rotated in there, and I think somebody else also. I think they had Risto in front, too, at one point, even though I don't think that's going to be something that they do very often. <laughs> so I mean, it, it obviously subject to change, but uh, maybe you can speak, Dan, to some of the philosophy that you see coming out with, with some of these moves. Yeah, I mean, in the power play was a real sore spot last year. A lot of people disagreed with the fact that they had Giroux on the right side for a, a lot of the year, and then they finally moved him back to the left, and things seemed to click a little more. You know, Giroux's kind of known for that one-timer on the left side of the power play. You're going to have a big change because Jake Voracek had kind of been a fixture on the right side of the power play, which I think it's going to help not having him there. You kind of freshen things up. So they had Couturier in that spot alternating with Giroux. Look, I would keep Giroux on the left and, and you know, I, I I agree that Keith Yandel at the point on that top power play unit is fine. He's, he's a power play specialist. When I think when we had Charlie O'Connor on last time, he kind of talked about how they, the, the team and the front office wanted to change the flow of the power play from a shoot first point mentality with Shane Goss to more of a uh, flow and pass first. And I think we were talking about it in the sense of, hey, Cam York might make the team. And that's kind of, you know, what he specializes in. Well, it's the same thing with Keith Yandel. He's a good puck mover. So I think that's kind of what they're looking at on that that top power play unit. So I have no problems with that unit with Jeru, Couturier, Konechny, JVR, and Yandel. The second unit, you know, I, I think that Morgan Frost, if he makes this team, which it looks like he's going to, he absolutely needs to be on a power play. I mean, that's where... That's where a lot of his value is going to come in. He's basically like a Claude Giroux in terms of talent level. The skill level is just so high that you need him on the power play, and you don't want him in the slot. You know, you were mentioning that they were rotating him at the slot position. Yeah. That's not where you want Morgan Frost. I think that they're, like, throwing Ivan Provorov a bone by having him on the power play at this point. I'm just not sure that ultimately that's what's best for the team. I think that maybe having Ellis at the point and then Frost on the... I like him actually on the right wall because he's got a really good one-timer from there. He also can pass the puck from there. That's where I would have Frost. He's kind of the opposite of Giroux on the power play. You know, Giroux's a righty shot. Frost is a lefty shot. They both have good one-timers. 
Uh, they're both really good at moving the puck. So that's kind of like I'm fine with Atkinson, Farabee, Ellis, Frost, and then I'd either have, you know, Broussard or, or whoever else on that power play unit. But, you know, the, I think the key is going to be people just want – them to be able to adapt like if the power play is not working Tarion's gonna have to change things around a little bit but you know we'll, we'll hopefully they'll get there yeah they, they kind of like their point men to be kind of like a uh, point guard more than a uh, a gunner so uh yandel can do can definitely shoot and so can ryan ellis so but uh, good passing good hockey iq chef I, I would say I, I like the fact that Rel, Ryan Ellis on power play too, and I and I like the fact that Morgan Morgan Frost on power play too. I'm not sold on Provy like Dan said. I I would just probably go with Morgan Frost, maybe manning one of the points and possibly going Oscar Limbaum, uh, taking that slot on the left side or the right side. It does at this point. I just think him coming back. Uh, I think he he's gonna. He, it looks like he's got his form back, and if that, I want that kid uh, getting like he's he's very good at protecting the puck. If you have to go into a corner or behind it, I just think that he. I think he could blossom in that sec in that spot on the second power play. I th- I would. I'm more comfortable with him there than Provorov because I think he could get more out of that position. Then. No, I agree. I don't think uh, Ivan Provorov is a power play force no. at all. He has a good shot, but. I think it's more of a five-on-five offensive threat. The way I look at it is the Flyers haven't had that bumper position filled since the days of Braden Chen. So if Giroux is on the left side, I'd rather have a shooter like uh, Farabee in that bumper spot. And then it, with Frost, if he ends up on the left side, I'd have connecting with him, if you follow my logic there, to get that one-timer. Check. Yeah. But, you know, I think they'll work that out. And like, like Dan said, they have to be open to change. Hopefully they'll adjust as, as time rolls along with that as the changes are required to make. So let's take a look at the PK. I don't know if we could have the structure so much. I mean, we could talk about the personnel and how it's going to play out. We're going to see some combination of Lawton, Thompson. I think you're probably going to want to have at least one guy out there with some speed, not only to be a threat going the other way, but also to kind of not get caught behind the play. Uh, Sandheim, Justin Braun, you're going to have uh, Risto out there, Oscar Lindblom. They talked about NAK. I didn't say much about NAK. I'm not a fan of the player as far as I'm concerned. I, I While I, I agree with some of the attributes that he's shown in the past, I don't know. If he's going to be worth it, we'll see. There are a lot of challengers uh, for his spot if he has another down year, but he should get a crack uh, on the penalty uh, kill as well. And uh, if Lashinsky ever shows up and makes the the team, uh, he will. And of course, uh, Hayes, when he comes back, will be working those units as well. Chef, any comments about uh, some of those combos? No, I think you're. I think that's a fair assessment of Nack. I, I think he, at this point he needs to prove uh, he, that he's not just inconsistent. Like two years ago, he's amazing. He was hitting everything. He was great on on uh, you know on, on four check. Uh, he, he was he wasn't he wasn't checking himself out of position, which ended up being his biggest problem. He would go out of his way. I think he he overchecked. Let's if you can say that he overchecked, and as a result, it drew him out of position. And then he's playing, trying to catch up to get himself back into a good defensive position. And he would end up taking a stupid hooking penalty or, or you know, a slash or something along those lines just to try to get back into the play. I think that's a fair assessment of him. If he can get back to the way he was before, he becomes somewhat valuable again. But as looking at the roster and all the, all the spots, if this team's healthy, uh, he, I don't see him. I don't know if he has a spot on this roster and, and he should be counting his blessing is you'd be working really hard to get in, you know, on AV's good side, because like, you know, I said it before, he's the odd man out and he's at the ceiling of what you can send down to the age. If, you know, if you have to. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. Either that or out of town. Cause like Dan mentioned, he's got some skill sets. They're going to like it. But before we leave the PK, Dan, I just want to mention Cam Atkinson. The guy's a threat. Okay. And probably, it's been quite a while since, you know, I know uh, Kevin Hayes, when he first came along, had a really good year 
in 20 when the PK in, in terms of being an offensive threat uh, going the other way. Cam Atkinson has more speed, is a better shooter, and he's someone to watch and give us a little bit of excitement that we haven't had in quite some time. Yeah, I would uh, – th- this goes back to almost what um, Ian LaPerria, who's going to be coaching the Phantoms, was talking about at a press conference a week and a half ago. He was talking about Morgan Frost, and if he had Morgan Frost to start the year, he said that he was going to put him um, on the PK because he likes having that kind of dynamic element on the PK. And so I, I think I'd like to see that with the Flyers, and hopefully someone like it, Cam Atkinson is the, is the guy that can bring that. I think that Joel Farabee eventually can be a kind of a guy on the penalty kill that can bring that kind of energy and speed and, and breakaway potential. So I wouldn't mind seeing that. But, yeah, those, those are the two guys that I'd like to see at some point worked into the penalty kill to kind of add that dynamic element. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chef? Yeah, to speak to, to Joel Farabee part, absolutely. I mean, when he was up before uh, – got called up and he said, I do believe I can't, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to misquote it. So I'll paraphrase it. He was doing everything he could. Uh, I'll do whatever I need to. He learned PK. He did everything. He, he, he did that to make himself more valuable and ended up working. I mean, uh, when he first came up two years ago, he, he, he played a little bit of a PK and he wasn't bad of it. And I, I just, I, I think he, he has a good shot of becoming a very good all around player. Uh, for this team in the, in the future. And I wouldn't mind seeing him get a little more uh, penalty kill time. I, I think he, the way he plays, uh, he's got that natural, I guess, awareness of the ice. And I, I think it could be advantageous for the, the, the penalty kill because we saw how bad special teams were the last season. Oh, there's no doubt. Yeah, he's a, he's a 200-foot player. He's a threat everywhere on the ice. He just has to progress a little bit more every year and he's going to grow into that guy who you count on to make uh, some kind of play to change the game. He may never be spectacular like a Gagne with that speed and shot, but he's very intelligent like Simone in a lot of ways. But um, yeah, so stepping a little bit aside from what's happening on the ice, I just wanted to mention briefly about Dave Scott, does his you know yearly update about the state of the franchise, and he talked a lot about how frustrating it's been, and how it really got killed at the gate, like a lot of other teams did. But their season ticket sales are up, and that's all well and good, and the future is bright, like you'd expect guys like that to say. But they're, they're going to be streaming some more games, and I'm going to give Dave Scott a guy I'm not crazy about because he's not really a hockey guy, but I am going to give him credit. He, he pulled the trigger on the Hextall move. I like that right away. And he brought in Fletcher and the bias for action show this off season. So I'm going to cut him some slack. I don't like some of the other hires with the organization that have kind of not really endeared themselves to the uh, season ticket holders and also um, seem to be a little bit disconnected from the team's past, which, hey, we get things change, but there's some things that you always want to hang on to. So you have a vestige of uh, what got this team and to be as popular as they were besides what they were on the ice. There was a whole package that came with the Flyers, the whole family atmosphere that's kind of dissipated in this uh, period of time that we lost Mr. Snyder. So um, does Jeff any comments in that regard? No, I think you covered it all. I yeah. mean, you're never going to get rid of that 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 bully pass and and the admiration that the like what the thing about Mr. Snyder is he was a fan too, and it was amazing, and and that was I think the most daring part of him. Whether or not, like, example, you know, Brzezgalov signing and all the other stuff that happened over the years, it wasn't for it wasn't for lack of trying any of the crazy stuff that happened. It's because he generally cared and he actually thought that he could make it better. And he, he loved this team. And and I think there might be, like you said, a little bit of a disconnect from and I think they're they're trying to put their own stamp on what the next generation of, of, of Flyers fans are going to be. I just 
you know, you, you can't lose sight of your roots. And I, I think if they acknowledge that, you know, with some of the alumni stuff and, and all the other things, I just really think that they, 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 they could even get more fans on board if they just bridge the gap between generations, so to speak, you know? Yeah, yeah. And speaking to some of the things that Chris Turian's talked about recently with our buddies yeah. over at Snow the Goalie, I think there's some really good points there. But, uh, you know, listen, winning is the best deodorant. And, Dan, you know, one of the things A.V. talked about in the offseason was looking at his defensive structure, his schemes, his systems, what what the winning teams have in common. And I've always felt like, you know, I guess as I matured as a fan – the best teams have a way of swarming to the puck, and it's not necessarily as much about speed, although that certainly helps. It's about positioning and total attention to detail. Yeah, so another one of the things that Brian Ellis was talking about was that it's a different system that he's used to playing in Nashville. And so how this is a much more sort of aggressive forecheck, more aggressive in the neutral zone that he's used to playing and so not that that's good or bad it just kind of brought to light the fact that AV's system is a little bit different than than some of the other systems out there and let's be honest like elaine vino has a track record of starting off really well in cities and then kind of dropping off we saw that in year one this team was really good in year one and last year really dropped off now we're in year three i think we're all hoping for a rebound and I think it's probably not fair to kind of say, oh, AV's just been dropping off various places. So that's what's going to happen here. I think that he probably views this as like not a last chance opportunity, but I think that AV is probably putting a lot into this season because in the offseason, Chuck Fletcher basically turned over, you know, 30% of the roster. And so if, if, they're, if this team doesn't play well this year, you can't blame Chuck Fletcher. Like, he went out and he did a lot. The players really, a lot of them were already turned over. So I feel like if this team doesn't perform on the ice this year, it's going to come down on the coaching staff. So for Elaine Vigneault, this is a very important season. And he's got a full preseason, full camp to work on the players with his systems you know, they, they're scheduled to open the season is pretty light. They start with the Canucks, who don't even have their two best players signed yet, and the Kraken, who don't really look that good. So I think there's a lot of pressure on AV to kind of make sure that this team gets off to a good start and, and continues it. Yeah, yeah, it's really funny you mention that. I, I was on with uh, Jim Iacovone with High and Wide last week, and I, I was saying – A.V. didn't even want to be here toward the end of last year. And I I think something we talked about, I I think A.V. probably took a long, hard look at whether he wanted to do this, relayed that to Chuck. And, like, not so much from that perspective, like, I don't want to do this unless, you know, you make certain changes or what have you. I think he probably said, we really need to make changes. I got to gear it up to make some changes this year, and I need certain kind of personnel. But, you know, I think A.V. is kind of like, He's really going to be burnt out if he has more failure. And like Dan says, Chef, you really can't blame Chuck Fletcher if indeed that's the way it turns out. It's almost like he has something to prove. And that's (laughs) ironically what he's worn in almost every press conference, if not every press conference. The shirt with the Flyers will go with something to prove on it, correct? Right. So, and and I really do. I I think – like like you said, look, if you go out, oh, I, I can't build, I can't, I can't, I can't be a carpenter without a hammer. Boom, here's your hammer. I can't be a chef without a, a stove. You know, here's your stove. You're getting everything handed to you that you kind of complain. No, well, maybe not complain, but said, hey, look, this is what we're lacking. And by all accounts, I think they did eighty. They filled eighty to ninety percent of what they needed. And I think that now you're right. The pressure is on him. They they need to perform. This is. This is a team that needs to do well, not only regular season, but deep into the playoffs. Or otherwise, it is going to be on the coaching. Now, it might not be the head coach. It might be, you know, the assistants that take a lot of the heat because of either special teams or power play or penalty kill. Whatever it is, you know, playtime's over. This is the real deal. You, you know, the coaching staff got what they wanted. 
and sort of speak or, or mostly got what they wanted. And now it's time to put, you know, the money where the mouth is. Here you go. Go out there and get it done. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. I, I think that this is a make or break. This is a, like a mini win now period for them. And then yeah. if it doesn't work out this year or next, I, I think it's this year they have to make some real progress towards like, okay, I can see next year a further ascension and even championship contention. It's hard to go from where they were last year and then just all of a sudden, even with the turnover, just turn into a cup contender. I just don't think they have the personnel. We have to see what Morgan Frost and some of these other younger players can be and, and, and see a return t- to form with Oscar and Farabee take like maybe another step. And the two young defensemen that are left with this team in Sandheim and Provorov, uh, it, you know, return to form in terms of Pro, with Provorov and Sandheim take another step toward more consistency. So, and of course, the, the elephant in the room, Dan, it, it's none other than Carter Hart. He really is the most important player on the team. They could give him all the help in front of him with structure and, and less high danger chances, but he's got to get it done because I, I think we all agree that Martin Jones is uh, 30 games and that's about it. If you need more than that for Martin Jones for any reason, this season's not going to go anything like we want. You know, we've, I mean, we've, we've talked about this a lot and, and I sort of, I, I, I say the same thing every time and it's, it's, it is sort of, we're all just assuming slash praying that Carter Hart is going to return to his form of two years ago or even build on that. Because if he plays like he did last year then none of this conversation really matters because they're, they're not going to be a playoff team so we're all just kind of sitting here we're talking about the forwards and the defense and the d- improvements that have been made in the offseason and all the players that have been brought in and the new climate in the locker room none of that m- matters at all if carter hart doesn't you know take the next step in his career and so i think we're we're all just assuming it and we're optimistic about it right and i think that all the signs are positive he said he's gotten over whatever was going on last season and it's typical growing pains that young kids have i i think we're all sort of hoping that martin jones can get can you know get back to what he was three years ago because he's been really bad the last two years it's not quite as important as carter hart but it's it's also important so we're we're taking some big leaps of faith with with the goalies and we just kind of have to hope that that they get to where we think they're going to get to and and do i think that it's going to happen yeah i think carter hart is going to be pretty damn good this year i do i think martin jones is going to be better than he's been the last two years absolutely so i'm optimistic about it but it still gives me a little bit of of pause and fear thinking about it oh yeah (laughs) no doubt about it so i'm gonna back away from uh the flyers for a second here i just wanted to get you guys opinion about something i think it was off the post radio was talking about jack eichel being stripped out in buffalo of the captain scene we all know we've talked about his neck injury and the controversy about what procedure he wants to get versus the traditional fusion and all that and he's out i mean he he's not coming back to buffalo there's no way but someone compared it to Stripping Lindros and giving the captaincy to Eric Desjardins. And while the circumstances were somewhat similar in that this is such an important player and the most important player for the respective franchises, there were some particular differences in that the Flyers were a stable franchise and Buffalo is a, a a dumpster fire. Chef, do you care to weigh in? On that, just a, a, a just as a point of interest to uh, discuss what you think about w- when you heard. I, I thought this is just it, it, it. It's more drama, but more importantly, I, mean, I didn't. To me, me, it wasn't necessary. I didn't like it when it happened to Lindros. I thought it was a little bit disrespectful, to especially one of the. He, at, at that point, he had been one of the best players in the league at that time. Although I want to decline, I just still think it wasn't cool. Uh, and, and in this case, it's like, why, why, why kick him when he's down? 
he, he can't play. We all know he can't play right now because of the injury. It, it just, it seemed like it's like, you know, when your house burns down, somebody comes over and kicks your dog. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it's just, it's the same. It, to me, it's like it, it was unnecessary. It, it didn't need to be done. It just, you start the season with three A's, and when you get rid of them or do what you got to do, you just name a new captain. It, it didn't have to be. Unless there's stuff going on behind that we don't know about that it made it really personal, uh, then I didn't think it was necessary. But that's that's the mistake. You know, and, and the other thing is, if, if Kevin Adams is not Bob Clark, as one of the writers pointed out, and I totally agree. That reminded me of uh, Tammy Wynette, where D-I-V-O-R-C-E became final today. So maybe it's like three people that get what I just said. But that was actually a song. So I... I as a big Lindros fan, Dan, just if you cared to weigh in with that before we go through the Flyers schedule, I just uh, I'll take any comments that you have. <laughs> you know, I just tear up whenever I think about anything with Eric Lindros because we should have won a Stanley Cup, and uh, it just everything about it. There's so much glory and happiness surrounding my emotions thinking about Eric Lindros. And then there's so much sadness thinking about my emotions with Eric Lindros. It's like we had this guy who was the most talented hockey player in the history of the Flyers franchise. I don't think anybody's going to argue that point. And he came in and it was such a high at first. And then it just became such an absolute train wreck that I, I don't know. I can't even, you know, I was, I was pretty young when, when that was all happening, probably in my, you know, my teens and my, early 20s it's hard for me to compare and contrast especially also i think that the social media area era has kind of changed how we think about these things like i think fans sort of like know more about the situations now than they used to know about the situations back then and so it's hard to sort of compare and contrast what kind of um, impact those situations had but, uh, you know, I don't know. I just think the Buffalo Sabres organization is such an absolute dumpster fire. I, it, it, you've got to think, in, unless I know more about the situation, it just seems like they're being so unfair to Jack Eichel in this circumstance. Whereas with the Flyers situation, and I think even Eric Lindros would acknowledge this, like his parents were a major problem. And they were getting involved in everything. I mean, his mother accused the, the Flyers... Uh, you know, trainer of sabotaging his skates or the equipment manager of sabotaging his skates in that series against either the Panthers or the lightning. Yeah. Like yeah. it was, it was a bad situation with his parents. So it's, it's hard to com compare and contrast, um, you know, but I, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I, it's hard to even talk about some of the, the Lindros stuff because there was just so much hope there and it just never really completely materialized. But, um, but yeah, I hope I hope for for Jack Eichel's sake that things are able to move forward there for him. Yeah, uh, the the Lindros situation to me will always be one of contributory negligence on both sides, and yeah. it's, a, it's a shame the way it worked out. In, in terms of um, you know, Eric's acquisition was the highlight of my uh, sports life in terms of off the ice. It is the most anticipated player of all the sports. And I, I was I was like football and hockey. I mean, I love when Moses came here. I was shocked when Reggie White was as good as he was. And even to Carson Wentz, which, you know, listen, whatever you want to say about him, his performance that year led to an Eagle Super Bowl. And Dr. J coming to the, the 76ers and... Um, uh, Pete Rose, and he turned out to be the missing piece. If you if you tie up 50 years of sports, there's, for me, I, Eric Lindras was simply the greatest acquisition with all the drama and the soap opera mm -hmm. behind it with the two teams bidding on him the way it, it all turned out. It was storybook. The only thing missing was the Stanley Cup. So, listen, it was fun while it lasted, but uh, I, I can only wish Jack Eichel the best. If someone has had, had his neck fused, if he wants to get a disc replacement, well, let him have at it. You know, because if he gets a fusion, it is likely with contact he'll need more fusions. And that's what he's trying to avoid. But, hey, that's just one man's opinion. But, uh, gents, 
we're going to call it right there because the Flyers play tomorrow night versus the Islanders. I don't know if Zdeno Chara will be in the lineup, but he is an Islander. And then, of course, the Flyers play a couple nights later at Boston. And then uh, we'll be back. Let me see. And then Washington at home on Saturday, October the 2nd. Then we'll be back to see you October the 3rd. And we're going to have Kevin Durso from 97.3 on to tell us uh, about some things that went on with the game, sort of the inside information about, you know, how players like Frost and Risto look. And a lot of the guys we talked about tonight, we'll leave it at that. And, of course, we'll have a season preview show right now tentatively scheduled for Monday the 11th with a very special guest that we're very excited about. But uh, before that, we're really excited to have Kevin uh, on the show because he did such a great job when he was on uh, last time. So with that, uh, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, Chef, where can people find you on social media? You can interact with me on on Twitter at Chef to the Left B. That's Chef to the uh, the number two left B. Terrific. Uh, Dan? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at uh, dsilver88, and uh, yeah, throw me a follow and have some conversation there. And by the way, the next show, October third, is my birthday, so you know, birthday uh, special. Whoa, whoa, oh, right. whoa! Don't yeah. bury the lead, pal. Come on, it's the birthday oh, my show. Gosh. The birthday show. There you go. And there you there go. You go. <laughs> Another year younger. <laughs> That's right. Another year better. So, yeah, I'm Isaiah, I-S-A-I-A-H, underscore 520, at Isaiah. Don't forget the underscore 520 on Twitter. And, of course, you can follow the OMB Podcast at OMB Puck, at OMB Puck on Twitter. We have a Facebook page. And, of course, we're on YouTube. Hit that notification bell. Follow yeah, give us a like if you if you if you like what you're listening to on YouTube. If you could give us a, a five star review, if we've earned that, by all means, we appreciate that. If you follow us, and if you subscribe, whatever your platform terminology is, it helps move us moves us up the chart when people are looking for Philadelphia Flyer podcast. So we do appreciate that. So until Sunday, next Sunday, the birthday show. For the great Dan Silver, everybody take care.